Good evening. Welcome to Dominican University of California's Leadership Lecture Series in partnership with Book Passage. The series is a program of the Institute for Leadership Studies, a center for leadership development offering education and training for students and professionals to become better leaders. The Institute hosts public forums like this one to engage students, the campus, the community and socially relevant discussions, highlighting inspired acts of leadership across the academic disciplines. I'm thrilled to welcome one of Dominican's most famous alumni. We call her Dr. Allende since she has received an honorary doctorate from our university. Twelve years ago, we formed, our, we formed the Institute for Leadership Studies and our first public forum was to feature community leadership and civic engagement. Ms. Allende was kind enough to be our featured speaker to help tell her story of how her foundation supported a school of girls in Bangladesh who had suffered abuse. She helped to launch our Institute for Leadership Studies community forums, and we are enormously grateful that she generously accepts our invitations to join us here at Dominican. This live performance will be aired on Dominican's website at dominican.edu slash leadership. Our lectures are also aired Wednesdays at 8 p.m. on Channel 30 of Public TV. I'd like to thank our lead sponsor for this year's series, Private Ocean, Personal Powerful Wealth Management, one of the oldest and largest privately held wealth management firms in Marin. Named seven times by Worth Magazine as one of the top 100 registered investment advisors nationwide and awarded the best place to work in the Bay Area by the San Francisco Business Times and the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Private Ocean's team is committed to community engagement as is witnessed here this season with their fifth year's The Leadership Lecture series lead sponsor. Please join me in thanking Private Ocean for continuing to help bring our community together. And I guess I forgot in the beginning to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Dr. Laura Stivers. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences that is housed in this building. Um, I'd also, uh, before I introduce our next uh, speaker who's going to introduce um, Dr. Allende, I wanted to say that uh, Elaine told me she lied. We are not going to have cards, but we're going to have open mic uh, for discussion afterwards. So, also join me in offering a great shout out to all of our students, staff, and faculty volunteers dedicating their evening to welcome you here today. And to introduce our guest is Dr. Susan Duval Dixon, partner and chief operating officer of Private Ocean Wealth Management. Susan has more than 35 years experience in business management across several industries, serves on many nonprofit boards, and teaches in Dominican's MBA. Good evening, everyone. So I get to introduce, introduce Isabel Allende. Isabel has appeared in Angelico Concert Hall here at Dominican so often that she's not only a special guest, but she is our friend. Born in Chile, Isabel's New York Times best-selling works of fiction and nonfiction are celebrated throughout the world. She is regarded as the most widely read Spanish language author on the entire planet. You've heard the numbers and they continue to amaze us. Beginning with her first best-selling novel, The House of Spirits, published in 1982, Isabel has authored 20 books that have sold more than 65 million copies and it has been translated into 35 languages. That's pretty impressive. Two of her books have been turned into international movies, and in addition, Isabel has received 14 international honorary doctorates, including one from this university. She has won 50 awards in more than 15 countries, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2014. In 1996, she founded the Isabel Allende Foundation to support the empowerment of women and girls. It has 
awarded grants to more than 100 nonprofits worldwide. In 2011, Isabel actually planned to retire. Well, you can see how that worked out. <laughs> Isabel is here tonight to introduce us to her newest novel, The Japanese Lover. Joining her on stage in conversation is Don George, Travel Writers and Photographers Conference Chair for Book Passage. Please welcome our very special friend, Isabel Allende, in conversation with Don George. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Could you hear it? I couldn't hear anything in the back. <laughs> That's because you were in the back. <laughs> they heard it beautifully. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Isabel. Hello. How are you? Good. Can't you see? I you look, look great. Beautiful. You look I amazing. Great. You yeah. look amazing. <laughs> but it takes, really... a, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and money. And I money. Can't of course. That. <laughs> you are naturally radiant, I think. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So it is, as always, an incredible pleasure and honor to share the stage with you. We've done it so many times. We have. We have nothing new to say to we each other. We should take it on the road. Yeah. <laughs> He's my sort of virtual lover. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the, you know, I wrote the book. I wrote the book thinking of him because when he laughs, his eyes go like go like this, like little Japanese eyes. <laughs> Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's, oh, wow. that's, that's your greatest charm, Don. <laughs> that's going to change all my questions then. Okay, yeah, gonna... go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so this book is wonderful. Um, it's really an amazing, beautiful, touching, extraordinary story. Thank it's you. It's really, really great. Thank you. I loved it. Without even knowing that I was the character, yeah. so <laughs> now I love it even more. But um, what was the genesis for The Japanese Lover? It was a sentence. Sometimes you get these gifts from heaven. I was walking in the streets of New York with a very good friend, and she told me that her mother, who was 80, had had a friend for 40 years that was a Japanese gardener. That was it. And then we talked about something else, shoes or hats or whatever. <laughs> and it stayed with me, the idea that maybe he was not just ah. a friend. Ah. Maybe there was more than that. Wow. Because if I had had a friend for 40 years, I would have slept with him, of course. <laughs> so, of course. Of course. <laughs> and especially a Japanese gardener. Yes. yes. So um, I started imagining things and imagining, putting myself in the place of that woman at that age, in an, probably in a retirement home, remembering mm. the past and, and, st and having this enduring love that lasts all her life. And that was the origin of the book. Wow. And now the, the, the lady in, in, the, in real life is from Jewish origin, and the gardener was Japanese. And I didn't think of changing them, hmm. because now that I think about it, it would have been better if he was Mexican, because, <laughs> because then I, could have, I, I would have put part of my culture in it, or even Chilean. But he came Japanese, and Japanese he stayed. <laughs> so that's the way it goes. What can you do? Yeah, you can't change certain things. No, you can't, because it's fiction, so you can't change it. You can't it. change I mean, it, that, no. That would be silly. <laughs> <laughs> so you, there's a lot of information. I mean, in, in addition to being a wonderful love story, lyrical tale, a beautiful tale of sort of San Francisco society. There's a lot of historical information. There's a lot of information in the book. How did you do, what kind of research did you have to do? To well, when I start book? a book, I always imagine what happened to the characters in the span of their lives. And in this case, it's a contemporary novel that happens in San Francisco. So I had to research the time and the place. The, the time is the 80 years that that woman and Ichimei, the gardener, lived and what happened in the place where they were living. And the, the event that changed their lives and marked their destinies was the Second World War. She would have not come as a refugee to the United States without the Nazis invading Poland. And, and her family disappeared in the concentration camps. 
And in, uh, the, in the case of uh, Ichimei Fukuda, he, he and 120,000 other people of Japanese origin were arrested after, uh, the, after the Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, and they were sent to concentration camps. They were not called that in concentration camps, they were called internment camps. And they lived there for four years and a half, lost everything they had, they were displaced because after they were released, they were not allowed to go back to the places where they came from. So it, it, it really marked their lives. The Issei, the first generation of, Jap of Japanese that had come from Japan, um, felt so ashamed, so embarrassed by what had happened, so dishonored, that they never spoke about it. And their children, who many of them had spent years in, in the camps, were not even allowed to mention the subject. So it was something that the community kept quiet for years. And it was the third generation that has unearthed the story and, and is now um, common knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that involved a lot of research. I mean, no, no, really history. simple research, because everything is available. Mm. I have done uh, is historical novels in which there is real research. This was just fun research. It was easy. It was easy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you go to the internment camps, for example? There's very little left. Yeah. There is one in Manzanar mm. that is, I mean, a, a couple of barracks and some photographs, that's where there are. But in Topaz, there is nothing. Right. So, uh, but there is a Japanese American museum where you can get a lot of information. Mm. Okay. And was there anything especially surprising to you when yes. you were doing your research? Yes. What was moving and surprising was that Many of the young boys in the, in the camps, um, 18 years old, they volunteered for the army mm. to fight in the Second World War. And they formed a, a regiment called the 442 Regiment. And it, it was the bravest regiment that, while their families were in concentration camps. Mm. And it is the most decorated regiment in the, hist in the military history of this country. Mm. And I thought that that was so, so extraordinary. That's an extraordinary. It, it, yeah, and they went to war with the, with the heart of a samurai. They had that tradition that you go to battle to die. Hmm. And it's an extraordinary story. Right, with their parents being in Yes, that has camps. not been told yeah. sufficiently, mm. I think. Yeah, you tell it beautifully the way you talk about it. But I tell it. only one case. Yeah, yeah. Was there a special resonance in this story for you? Yes. I was writing uh, this book. I, I've been answering a lot of interviews because I just finished a book tour in Europe. And the, 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 the questions are very different depending on the country. Mm. Um, but, mm. but many people ask about love, death, aging, mm. displacement. Those are m most of the questions. And I think that they all tap into who I am at this moment in my life. And when I was writing the book, my marriage of 27 years was ending. And uh, I was questioning, exploring the, the theme of love. Can mm -hmm. love endure passion? Can you feel passion at any age? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do I believe or not in, in a romantic relationship? Um, I was exploring aging also mm -hmm. because I'm over 70. I look good, but, but it's from a distance. You're not over 70. Yeah. And, and so I, I was asking myself, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. Because I, I feel as I felt 10 years ago, but I know that this is an, a, a process that doesn't stop day by day. My stepfather is 100. My, my mother is 95. Wow. Many of my friends and, and relatives are aging badly. And, um, and I see a lot of death around me. Mm -hmm. Even my adored dog, Olivia, died. So it was a year of losses and of sadness. You know, when, when my daughter Paula was, when she died years ago, my mother said, uh, this grief, this sorrow, is like a long, dark tunnel. That, and you have to go alone mm -hmm. with the certainty that there is light at the end. Wow. Just keep walking, one day at a time, 
step after step, tear after tear. And I walked the tunnel writing for a year. And really, at the end, there is light. Mm. And so when, when this awful year started to happen, unravel, I thought, OK, this is a minor tunnel compared to the other one. It's a shorter tunnel. Mm. And let's walk one day at a time. And suddenly, I was on the other side. And I feel great. Mm. <laughs> so I, I feel that I, I'm facing a luminous time in my life. Wow. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's really beautiful what you just said. Don't uh, talk like that. You, you <laughs> <laughs> No, that was really so, awful what yeah, you just so, yeah, said. So mushy. <laughs> so mushy. <Yeah. laughs> right. <laughs> yes, it comes with the package. I don't know what to tell you. But you know, you, you know about Japanese lovers. You have one. I do. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. I do. I'm an expert in the subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you married her. <laughs> I married her. And yes, exactly. You know, yeah. uh, today there is a beautiful article that you wrote with a photograph of you and, and Kuniko in, in the picture. There I didn't is. recognize you. You <laughs> were true. young and handsome. <laughs> I was. I was. <laughs> Once young and handsome. Yeah, Hard as it may be to believe. <laughs> My wife is in the front row Where somewhere. Is she? I don't, there she is, right oh, in the middle. Hola, how are you? <laughs> right. Isabel's referring to an article that was just published online, which is a description of my wedding long ago. It's a beautiful article. You have to read it. And there is a pretty amazing photograph that goes with yes. it. That, Shows me in full samurai mode, and Kuniko in full beautiful porcelain doll, Japanese wedding mode, and it's it's a good photo. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you, what you said about aging and death, I was, not to get off of love because I love love, but I was incredibly moved in the book about your depict with your depictions of, of people aging and people in old people's homes and the kind of tenderness and care that happens there. And it seemed almost like a new level of writing for or a new level of subject matter for you. I thought it was incredibly beautiful and touching. And uh, Could you talk some more about well, that? I think that we live in a culture of, in, in which we value productivity, youth, beauty, and mm -hmm. success. Right. And if, if you don't belong in that group, you're out for whatever reason. And the, the huge population that is aging is out. Now we have all the baby boomers reaching their older age, and the baby boomers have been pushing the envelope in every, in every aspect of the culture, and now they are pushing the envelope of aging. So before, a, a person was mature at 30 or 40, and at 50 and 60 you were older and you would retire, and then mm -hmm. you were old at 75 and you died, because <laughs> that's the time when everybody died. Right. Now you live 30 years longer right. that, after you retire. And um, what happens in that time? It, it's, it, we, we see it like one big thing, but there are stages in that. I mean, I am not in the same stage that my parents are. And I th in the book, there is a character that explains that and says, um, being old is not the same as being ancient. When you are old, you are still capable of doing almost everything that you did before. Mm. Uh, when you are, another in, as you get older, you start losing independence in every sense. Mm -hmm. you, you, you lose your senses, your ability to think, your memory, and your independence. And then you are much, much older. So we cannot put everybody in the same package. Mm. And then there's the aspect of death that in the book I treat it, I talk about euthanasia a lot in the book. Because I think that um, as I was talking to older people, especially in retirement homes, there is the, the, the terror of an undignified and painful death. And the, the, the right to be helped to die with dignity should be an option for everybody. There are countries like the Netherlands or, or Switzerland where this has been going on for 20 years. And that doesn't mean that people are killing each other here and there, no. It's an option. Mm. And uh, fortunately, it has been already approved, legalized in five states in the United States. And by the time I, and I need it or you, it will be legal everywhere, mm. I hope. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah. How is the process of writing 
this book. I mean, all of your books are so very different in subject. Is the process essentially the same for each one? Or how was the process in, for this for, book? For this book, it was such a gift. Because um, I start all my books, as usually, on, the, on January 8th, and I had nothing but that sentence. Mm. A, an old lady and a Japanese gardener. That's all I had. But I had researched the time, and I had researched the place, the Bay Area. But it was easy because I live here. Right. So it was a really easy research. And then slowly, in the process of writing, the characters start to define themselves. And in a way, they tell me their lives and their stories. And the story unfolds naturally. Mm. Um, many people have commented on the structure of this book that goes back and forth in time. And, and it seems like almost like a braid mm -hmm. in which the characters move. It, it wasn't, I didn't think about it. It mm. was the way it, it came organically. Mm. And, uh, and so it was an easy book to write. And I felt it very personal. It was, my parents were there, my friends, the, the Redwoods. It was so, so familiar mm. in many ways. Wow, that's amazing. It reminded me of a kimono, the way the silk threads are interwoven with each other. That's the you way know I a lot about Japan. <laughs> I do, yeah. I really do. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, did you know the end when you began? Or did the end? No, I didn't know the I, I knew, well, I can't say the ending, of course. But um, I don't want to ruin my own book. No, no. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But the, the ending was surprising to me also. Wow. Yeah. Did but then the, en the, the ending, in a way, uh, it, it's a book about secrets. Right. There are, everybody has right. a secret, mm -hmm. and it's about memory. And the secrets start to, to, to be revealed slowly. But the last secret in the book, it was a revelation for me too. And how did that happen? How was that secret revealed to you as the writer? I don't know. I think it, it was like magical in a way. Hmm. You were sitting at your desk writing and suddenly... Suddenly the idea comes. Well, I'm a very good writer. That also... You are. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, You're I have... an awesome writer. Yeah, I have so much experience. <laughs> you have so much experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> But I love when he, when he laughs, he turns purple, have you noticed? <laughs> <laughs> I turn the color of your... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, it was a very, it's a surprising ending, but I, I love the way the characters Don't interweave. Ah. I'm not going to say the ending, okay. I promise. Go ahead. I, Go ahead. There is a final page and there's a period, <laughs> that's yeah. where the book ends. But, um, I was wondering in the writing process how that happens to you because it seems to me, like you've told me in the past, that your, your characters almost dictate the story. They, they take up residence in your brain and they start telling you mm -hmm. what the story is. And so you have all these and, different voices. But I voices. think also the research gives me a lot. The yeah. research sort of guides the book in one direction or the other. The fact that there were internment camps and that the Fukuda family would have by force been there determined half the book. Mm. So the, character, the, the characters in that family were determined by that event, yeah. which came in the research. Right, right. What did you learn? What was the biggest thing you learned in the, in the writing of the book itself? I, I learned something about myself. I am, I'm really disciplined. And I learned that I can relax, that I can trust, that I have the skill now, finally, after all these years and all these books, and it can be just joy. Mm. I, I don't have to, to, to be whipping myself to do it. You know, I, I always hear in my head the voice of my superego, the voice of my grandfather, that is always demanding more effort, more work. It could be better. What are you doing? You have not researched enough. And you know, all, that voice. And um, I think that what happened with this book, because it was written at such a painful time, for me, um, I, could, I could ignore the voice, fuck off to the voice, <laughs> and, and just, just enjoy your, the process. To your grandfather? To my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and just enjoy the, 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 the oh. let, let it be, let it, let it flow. 
and, and huh. if I could write all my future books like that, it would be wonderful because then, I, then I'm really enjoying it. Mm, that's beautiful, yeah. What did, you, what did you learn about love? I learned that love can endure with a lover, not with a husband. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <clears throat> Well, I think I need a glass of water <laughs> right now. But, but think about it. With, with, a married couple has all the inconveniences of the routine, boredom, raising kids, paying bills, sleeping in the same bed forever. <laughs> <laughs> the you make it sound so tedious. <laughs> it's very tedious. It can be great. I mean, you can be great friends. You can end up holding hands mm. and in the sunset. Mm. But with a lover, you only meet for love. You only meet to enjoy each other, to share the best of you mm. with a lover. And that is something exquisite that if you can have, I totally recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I can see social media lighting up right now. Hmm. What do you think about... <laughs> I'm trying to get serious. Yeah, I'm, I'm adrift in a sea of passion <laughs> right now. Um, Kuniko, be prepared for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about romantic love and versus sort of passionate? I think they go together. At least in my case, I, I, I cannot imagine myself passionate with someone that I'm not romantically involved. Mm. And I am a ro very romantic person. I think that I believe in the best qualities of each one of us. And, and if we can love with an open heart, um, taking all the risks, getting hurt in the way if necessary, that's romantic for me. Mm. And, and I want that in my life. Is that a theme for you? The it has been always a theme, mm. and it's on, in all my books. I've been accused of being romantic in my books. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, if I was a male writer, no one would accuse me of that. That's true. But because I'm a woman, I'm, I'm watched very particular, and then I can be accused of being sentimental or romantic for the same stories that if Garcia Marquez writes them, oh, he's a genius, right. and he gets the Nobel Prize. Right. <laughs> That's coming your way. No, I don't think so. Well. I wish, but it's not coming. No. What does a, you always start your books on January 8th. Mm. What does a day in the life of Isabel Allende look like? When I'm writing? When you're writing. When I'm writing, I get up very early, walk the dog, have coffee, and then go to my casita before. Now it's just a room, and I write. I write sometimes 10 hours a day. Uh, Ten hours a day. Because it's, it's, once you get in, into it, you can't stop. Now I'm trying to do less hours, if possible. Mm -hmm. I interrupt at, at noon, and I get in touch with my office to get the emails and what's going on with the office, and then I go back to writing. Do you write longhand? Then, no, I write directly in the computer, and then <laughs> without, without any notes or anything. Wow. And then I go to bed with a, with a book in my head, and the characters are there talking to me, and they, I'm, I'm all the time in the book. Impossible to get out. Wow. So I am adorable when I'm writing because no one sees me. <laughs> and the, the family loves it when I'm writing. And when I finish a book, they're all distressed. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, because they will see more of me. <laughs> so you're dreaming the book? You're I'm thinking of it all the time. The I'm, I'm driving the car, and I have to pull over because something comes wow. that is so powerful that I need to write it down. Huh. And then when, when do you know you're done? I don't know that I'm done. I just give up. <laughs> I, yeah, there's a point when you're just so bored with the whole you thing. Get tired yeah, of yeah, it. yeah, yeah, let it go. <laughs> you can always correct more. You can always add things. Right. You can always always make it better. So if you don't, there's a point when you have to decide. Okay, it, it, that's it. Right. Are there characters that die before and don't make it into the final book? Yes, of course. There are 
tall blondes, beautiful tall blondes that die on page 60. Uh, those are always dead before the middle of the book. Um, and there are characters that come back that are so persistent. Uh -huh. they, they keep coming back under different names and costumes. Um, the character of the grandfather, the, yeah. car the character of Isaac in the book yeah. is the same grandfather in Reaper, the same grandfather in uh, Maya's notebook. Mm. He's, he just he's there. sneaks back every time. <laughs> he's just always coming in. Yes. Wow. And he's so different from my own grandfather because this is a loving, oh. all accepting um, person that, that protects the, the, the main, the, the protagonist, the female protagonist. Right. I never had that in my life. Mm. And my grandfather, whom I adored, by the way, was a tough Basque who gave me the tools for life that, I have, that have been really wonderful in my life, but no, no kindness, wow. no praise, no um, cuddling, none of that. It was all about don't whine, don't complain, uh, a, a, an, an, an ethic of work and, and honesty and decency and r responsibility, mm. take care of other people, never allow anybody to pay your bills, you take care of yourself. Mm. You know, that, that, that served me in life for a long time. Yeah. But now I would like to just throw all that overboard and have <laughs> someone pay the bills for God's care. sake. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And take care of me. Exactly. Yeah, because I've, I've been taking care of everybody. Now mm, it's my turn. You deserve it. Yes, totally I deserve, deserve it, it, of course. Does that grandfather find a way into your books as well? The real one or no? No. No. So no. the one that you create is sort of the other side. The other side. side of yeah. And it's interesting because in my books there are no fathers. They are, mm. it's, it's a, wow. all, in all my books, fathers mm. are either absent or they have died or they are so severe that they are not really in touch with, with emotions. Right. Uh, there are always strong women that not necessarily are the mothers. Generally, they are not. So I, I look at my own life and I say, why do I have this, this thing yeah. of, well, I know absent fathers because my father abandoned me when I was three. But why don't I don't have mothers? I have such a great relationship with my mother. I have mother substitutes mm -hmm. and invented grandparents yeah. and invented lovers. <laughs> you know, once I was given a, a speech to a, a group of, um, a large group actually of um, librarians. It was th those conventions of librarians mm -hmm. and m mostly women, middle-aged women um, in cardigans and Birkenstock. <laughs> and, <laughs> And uh, first yes. question from the audience, a, a woman says, the, the erotic scenes in your books, are they out of experience? Or? <laughs> and I looked at the audience and I realized I couldn't lie. So I, I said, don't worry about it. You haven't missed anything. It's all imagination and research. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You haven't missed anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought you were assiduously researching all of those personally, but no. I wish. <laughs> but you write so amazingly about it. I have imagination. You have an amazing and imagination I then. I research a lot. <clears throat> yeah, okay. <laughs> I like it. I like it. What was the hardest part for you in writing this book? There was no hard part. None because I love all the characters. They, I, I have a great sympathy for each one of them. Each one has suffered something. Each one has a secret. Um, I, I, I like them all. Is there a character that was difficult at all, or did they all just come out beautifully and? Not beautifully, but they came out. And they, they, they talked to me, they, they, they were people. I, I had no difficulty. So it sounds like this was maybe the easiest book to write for you. Is that true? Was this the easiest book of all? In a way, yes. Because, um, y yes, yes. Is that just because you're so because amazing? I, at it? No, because I have enough experience now that, that I have done it so many times. It's like baking a cake. So when you do the 
thirtieth cake, mm. it's not as difficult as the first one or the second one. Right. Is it as much fun? In this case, it was fun. Yeah, it's fantastic. And you know, it has it's been received so well. In, in, in Europe, it's, it's doing great in several languages. And I, I wonder why so many people from different ages connect to this story that is so particular. It's a story about two old people. Mm. Well, it's a lot about a lot more than two yeah, old well, people. Yeah, well, but basically two old people. Yeah. You told me it was number one in... No, no, no. It was at the beginning, but now it's been six months in the bestseller oh, okay. list in Spain. Wow. in the Netherlands and in Italy, and it just came out in Germany and Portugal, and it's doing really well. Six months on the bestseller list. Yeah, my, in, in Spain, that's easy. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All my books just zoom right up there. And... In Spain, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. So I used to say you're a national treasure, but now I think I have to say you're a global treasure. Thank you so much. You really, really are. I look like a globe? You look like a treasure. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> and you just came back from your European tour, and you said that the audiences were incredibly receptive. And yeah, and there's the barrier of language. Yeah. So Germany, for example, I hope there are not many Germans here, but it's, it's really, really difficult because I don't speak a word of German. And the mm -hmm. German audiences are used to readings. So they can sit down and listen for a reading for two hours which is, here nobody would tolerate something like that. No. Or in Spain, or in Italy, let alone Italy. <laughs> like, yeah. and, um, and so the, the, the event goes like this. I walk on stage, say hello, and then I sit down and somebody reads in German for a long time. And I don't know what the heck they are reading <laughs> because I don't understand the word of what's going on. And then there is, there is an interviewer who asks a question in German or in English, and then somebody translates, and I answer in Spanish, and somebody re re translates into German. All this takes a very long time, a very long time. By the end of the evening, I'm sweating and exhausted, absolutely right. exhausted. But they love it. It's very strange. You never know what people can like. It says a lot about national character. Yes. <laughs> When you, as, as the Japanese lover was unfolding, did you sense a goal coming out in writing the book? Did you have a goal that emerged for you in writing the book? I don't understand what you mean. What do you mean a goal? Did you feel like, oh, this is a lesson I want people to take away no, from my book? Or? No, I don't want to deliver a message, preach anything, teach anything. I'm, it's not didactic. I'm, I'm trying to just tell a story. Mm. I love to hear a story. And when I read a book and I see that the author is trying to teach me something or, or give me a message, I get angry. Let me, let me find between the lines what, it, what is useful for me, but I don't want to be preached. Mm. And, and when I write, I, I, I'm very careful not to do that. So in this book, I don't want to deliver any kind of message or teach anybody anything. I just want to share this, a story that that is about love and life and death that is important for me. Yeah. Is the Isabel of your early books different from the Isabel of the Japanese lover? As, as a writer? As a writer and as a person? Well, as a person, mm. let's talk about the person later. Okay. <laughs> but as a writer, people say that this book is very different from the House of the Spirits. This is 35 years yeah. later. Right. The, and the world has changed. Literature has changed. Nobody writes in a Baroque, magic, realistic uh, style anymore. Mm. Uh, it's not me, and I have changed too, of course. And what I, I have also changed because I live in English. And that has affected the way I write in Spanish. Um, I lived for 27 years with a man who thinks that he speaks Spanish. And, uh, and so it's... It, it, <laughs> I, yeah, so of course my Spanish changed quite a bit, but also <laughs> language is a more, I mean English is a more precise language, less adjectives. Willie, uh, my former husband who was a lawyer, is a lawyer, say, says that he can tell if a letter comes in English or in Spanish before he opens the envelope. Really? Before in Sp because in Spanish it's heavier. 
<laughs> in, in, in Spanish, you need two pages or three to say what in English you say in one paragraph. And so that, that also has changed the way I see the world and the way I express myself and the way I write, of course. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I, I read something that I've written and I say, ah, this is overdone. Be because I, I have the English language in my head. Right, right. But there are things that I can only do in Spanish. I cannot right. do in English. I count, of course, in Spanish. I, read fi I write fiction in Spanish only. Mm. I cook. I make love in Spanish. <laughs> I would feel ridiculous <laughs> panting in English. Can you imagine? <laughs> so. <laughs> ridiculous. In Spanish, it sounds more real also. I, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try? I need to research that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you said, I live in English. That's such a great phrase. I live in English. Then. Right, right. And yet Spanish... Do you live in Japanese or you live in... I live in both, Japanese and English. You speak Japanese? I do. You make love in Japanese or in Spanish? I, I mean, in, sorry, <laughs> or, or in English, I mean. I have to think about that for a while. Unico. <laughs> Multilingual. Wow, wow, it must take a long time. <laughs> yes, we have dictionaries piled up yeah. around. Manuals and dictionaries. You never know. <laughs> there's, an, there's an app on the phone that you can have. There's an app on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so how about the person, Isabel? If I have changed? Yeah. yeah. I, but, I, but I have changed not because I've aged. I, there, there's a moment in my life when everything changed. And that is when I turned 50. And that was the year my daughter died. And I divide my life in before and after because I'm not the same person, and I, I can hardly remember the person I was before. Mm. Um, I was writing the caption for a photograph today, a portrait that uh, Mary Ellen Mark did uh, in December, right before she died, actually, which was a very sad thing. And she did uh, portraits of my family in New York, and one portrait of me alone. And when I looked at the, at the photograph, I saw what she was able to somehow catch with the camera, an underlying sadness mm. that is always under the skin. And it's not apparent. No, nobody, I think, sees it, but the photograph reveals it very clearly. And I identified with the picture because I, th I thought, this is me, exactly. Mm. And in a way, it's a good thing. I, I like that, that sadness. It makes me, it makes me more compassionate, um, less afraid. I think that the worst has already happened. Mm. And uh, I'm not afraid of anything, practically. Are you afraid of death? No. I'm afraid of dying without dignity. And that's what we were talking right, about. Right. But I'm not afraid of death. The process can be very painful, yeah. but death will happen to all of us. Was the book, in this sense, a kind of a therapy for you? No, it was an exploration. Mm. I, I went with a, with a flashlight into the darkness of a time, mm -hmm. the darkness of a stage in my life, of the end of many things, of, of the losses of a moment. And, uh, mm. uh, and it was... Very interesting mm -hmm. to explore that. And you came out the other end, it seems. Yes, I think I... Because you're in a luminous place now. I, that's how I feel. Yeah. That's wonderful. I mean, it's like a threshold book in a way. Ah, maybe. It gets you through a tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me ask if, the, if there are questions from the audience. But we should have the lights in the house because yep. we can't see if the audience. If you could audience. turn on the lights in the house. We can't see anybody here. They're all still here. They're all here? It's a good We sign. need more light in the house. And um, I think we have a microphone. And as soon as we have some lights and I can see your hands, I'll call on you to ask questions. Who is the person in charge of the lights up there? <laughs> yeah. Or you could all hold up 
flickers of... Yeah, good. Okay, here we go. So if you have a question for Isabel, please raise your hand. Okay, right, right there, in the right, right, our right-hand side. Thank you. Hi, Isabel. Hi. Um, a question about place, and I know that the San Francisco Bay Area is part of this tale, and could you tell me two questions? Could you tell me, do you see place as a character at all in your stories, and could you tell me personally what you appreciate and like about San Francisco and, and how or if this has made San Francisco Bay Area a home for you? Well, uh, I think that the place, place and time is the theater where the story happens, where the characters move. It's, it's a foundation. So for me, it's very important to research that even before I begin the book. Um, and why the Bay Area? Because I've lived here for many, many years. This is the place where my grandchildren were born and have grown up. Um, and this place has given me a lot. Uh, I came here as an immigrant with a sense that I didn't belong anywhere. And somehow um, here I found space, privacy. I feel very safe. Um, and I feel that I'm just one more person among millions of people who come from other places. Uh, there's nothing extraordinary about being an immigrant here. It's a place of diversity and where everything interesting happens and then it is projected to the world. Um, now we are talking much about technology that happens here, but before, all the ma many cultural movements, things that have moved the culture in one or another direction, uh, direction have, have begun here. And th th that is fascinating. There's a book that I enjoyed a lot, The Season of the Witch, mm. and, and I, I had finally the, the like the evidence of why I loved this place so much, because it was there well described. Great. Uh, yes, right on the left there. <clears throat> Buenas tardes, Isabel. Uh, we noticed that there's two different covers for your books, one for the English version and one for the Spanish. Can you talk why, a little why bit about that? Why different covers? Yeah, why did you have different covers? Well, I don't decide the covers. I have the right to approve or not, but, but each publishing house has a designer or, or several designers, and they, uh, they have different ideas. A cover that might work beautifully in Spain may not work here. Let me give you an, an, an example. Um, I have a book called Ines of My Soul, and on the, in the Spanish jacket there is a naked woman on the jacket. You cannot have a naked woman on the jacket in the United States because Barnes and Noble will not carry it. And you cannot show nipples in the United States. And uh, No, really, you can't. Really? And there, the, the jacket in mm. Germany is a couple embracing. The jacket in the, in the Netherlands is a, a, a girl uh, blowing a, fl a flower. Uh, it depends. Mm. Each, each publishing house has a different idea of what will sell, That's really. It's like a little snapshot yeah. of the culture. Uh, yes, in the about sixth, seventh row there. Buenas noches, Isabel. Hola. Uh, mi nombre es Gloria, and I would like to ask you, I know which one is my favorite book, and it's Mi País Inventado. And I would like to ask you, uh, which one is your favorite book and why, and how you changed when you were writing your favorite book, or if you have one? I don't know. I don't really have a favorite book. I can tell you which is the book that has the greatest response from the readers, and that's Paula. Um, it, it's a book that has endured in time. Also, The House of the Spirits, but that's because it's recommended or, or or obligatory reading in, uh, in schools and, and universities. So it has become like required reading, and in a way, it, it's still there in print. Mo all my books are in print, um, but, the, but Paula is the book that people can relate to mostly. And so um, we get at the office, I would say, several messages a week from people who are either reading the book and they, it has touched them for some reason, or they read it some time ago and then something happens in their lives 
and they connect to the book again. Um, so I feel very connected to my readers because of that book. Uh, it seems like as if Paula was touching people still there in the world. And in that sense, it's important for me. It's beautiful. Yep, on the left there. Hi there. Uh, what advice do you have for uh, society on how we should be treating old people? As you said, it's, it's a more and more increasingly be a young person's world, and as I'm getting older, that needs to change. Um, <laughs> yeah, you must be one of those baby boomers that need to push the envelope. <laughs> but just in your research, if you, if you have any lessons or, or think, you know, practical things about how society should be changing their view on, on older, the older generation. You know, we live here in the United States in a country that doesn't do much for anybody. I, I just came back from Europe, as I told you. Uh, let's talk about maternity leave, for example. You have a year of maternity mm. leave that the father or the mother can take. You have daycare that is free, and so the mothers can work. All, all that we don't have in this country. The same way, there, there are all kinds of programs to take care of older people. Full communities where they care for older people. And it's not as if we're housing them. The, it's, it's real communities where you can live a decent life and do the things you like. We don't have any of that here unless you can pay. And then what, that costs a fortune. Uh, and on the other hand, we don't have the extended families that, that can embrace all generations, the babies, the pregnant mothers, the, the people who are jobless, the, the old people, as they did before. All that's gone. So it's our job now to think what we are going to do with this aging population that needs to be taken care of and needs to, needs to have a life. I don't, I don't, I don't have a, the answer because the uh, retirement homes that I researched, um, except for the Redwoods, they were pretty awful. Hmm. There's a little understanding of what aging is all about. Yeah. People should read your book because it's No, because my book is, I, idealizes uh, old age. Yeah. In my book, I don't mention the, what happens to people who don't have resources, right. people who are poor, who are in bad health, who are disabled, who are alone. Right. So many people alone in, 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 in caves, practically, in apartments without light, with rats, and dying alone. Mm. Yeah. Right in the middle. Hello. I'm wondering if you choose the translator or if your publisher does, and I'm wondering if you are pleased with how they turn out. I can only read the translation into English, and I look at it very carefully. I don't choose the translator. Well, in a way I do, because they, they give me three or four samples without the names of the people, and I check the samples and see which one I like the best and then the editor decides about the, the translation. In, a, in other countries, I don't know. I don't have any idea. And my books are translated uh, to many languages officially, but several pirated also. Can you imagine what they translate? Ah, I have a wonderful mm. story about translation <laughs> that just, just happened. Um, I came back from, from the Netherlands, as I was saying, and, and one of the interviewers says, said, oh, I just loved Ripper. Your sense of irony is so wonderful. And I said, yeah? And he said, yes, that arthritic rabbit. <laughs> and I said, who? <laughs> and, and he said that I, well, in the book there is a healer, and the healer treats an arthritic poodle. They are, in Spanish, poodle is caniche, and caniche is, in French, Rabbit. So I don't know how it got done, but I, end, I ended up treating an arthritic rabbit, which is way better than a poodle. So that's a, why a case in which the translation improves the book. And I'm sure it happens nice. often. <laughs> yes, in the middle again. 
Hello. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 I can't believe it. I'm here. <laughs> I've been waiting like 10 years, just waiting for this moment. I'm really, really nervous. My name is Ay, Marcela. Gracias. Really, Isabel, this is a dream for me, and I'm sorry. Yeah. It's taking a lot. Um, I have a question. Uh, have you ever think about writing a book talking about illegal or undocumented people in this country? Talking about what? Undocumented people. Undocumented, undocumented people. people. In this country. In this country. Or immigrants, but undocumented immigrants. That is a... No, I think that I may have people like that in, in some of my books. I did in Ripper, I have a family of, of uh, people who are immigrants from, South, from Central America and they are in, have no documents. And about the hard way that they, the, the hard lives they have. But it's just mentioned in, in one of the, of the characters, it's not the whole book. Thank you. Yep, way on the right side there, all the way over. Hello. Um, Isabel, I can't help to notice the fact that some um, characters like ghosts and spirits come and go throughout your books. Is this pure literature? Is this just a narrative? Or is it something from your own? Is it something from yourself? So the question would be if I believe in ghosts. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't deny the existence of ghosts because it's very difficult to prove a negative. And I do believe that there is a, a mysterious dimension of reality, things that happen that we do not control, that we cannot explain. I grew up as a child in my grandparents' house and my grandmother spent her short life um, experimenting with the paranormal. She w was thought as being clairvoyant and she's the character of Clara in the House of the Spirits. Um, th on Thursdays, there were seances in, in the house, and so the idea was to call the spirits and ask them stupid questions, because, <laughs> I mean, what can you ask a spirit? Right. To knock twice for yes and <laughs> one for no, and, and the question was silly. Um, and all this happened around a table, a, an oval table, very heavy Spanish table. And they say that the table moved all around the, the, the mm. house. Now, I never saw it. Or I, this is the stories that I've been told innumerable times. Mm. So what's real and what isn't, I don't know. But I, think, I don't think that I will meet my daughter in another life, that she will be waiting for me at the end of a, of a tunnel of light, or that she will appear in, the for, in any form in my life now. But she's present. It's an exercise in memory and love. And she's present and will always be present. Now, how much is that real or personal? I don't know. And it doesn't matter. I think it adds uh, beauty and richness to my life and to everything I write. And I wish we would all feel in connected to that, that other world. We live in a culture that denies all that. And it's so sad. Mm. What do you think happens when we die? We die. <laughs> yeah. Period. End of story. <laughs> to us as, as individuals, as personality, as body, as mind, mm. we die. But if there is something that transcends, it has nothing to do with what you, we see here. It, um, I had an experience once with ayahuasca. I know it's illegal, but there are no cops here. Um, <laughs> and it was an experience of death, and it was so interesting because it started, I saw myself, well, first of all, the, the, the process of the lights and all that, but then there was a, po a moment when I was like a, a bird, an eagle that was flying, and I was, and then the eagle disappeared, and it was, like, like me in a spiritual form flying. Hmm. And then the person who was guiding this, I was in this white space, said, do you see a dark dot? And I said, yes, that's death. And I went through it like a bullet wow. with, with no fear and, and with such curiosity. And then there was nothing. There was no whiteness, no darkness, no 
there was void, but I was the void also. Wow. And no, absolutely no connection with anything that we know. And I think that maybe that's death. And it's not bad at all. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Have uh, you experienced something like that? No. Well, <laughs> no, not exactly, no. I don't, I don't. No. <laughs> Sorry. I keep thinking I should have something to say about that, but no. And I'm, I'm very confused about death. Do you fear death? No. But I fear dying before certain things happen. Like what? Like my kids getting married or having kids. My kids having kids. What does that to do with your death? I want to be there when those kids are born. Why? Because I'm selfish and I want to... <laughs> Enjoy it. And, and then you will want your great grandchildren. I know. It's going so to keep will going never on. Die. I'll never die, basically. Yeah, That's yeah, my no. plan. No, I, 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 I'm not attached to any of that. You're not attached to anything? N not to that. I mean, do I want to see Andy getting married and having children? I don't mind. It's her life. Hmm. I can die tomorrow happily. Really? Really. I've done everything I came to do. If there is a mission, I accomplished it. Like Bush. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it's really, right. It's really, it's really too bad that those two words from now on until eternity. Are forever linked. Yes. So you're done, in a sense. You're, you're, you're at peace. You feel like you've done what you wanted to do. And if I have not, it doesn't matter. Because, the, you know, many years ago, I had to give a keynote speech in a meeting of religious leaders. And the theme of, the, of this gathering was legacy. Mm. And the idea was that each one of us should think about our obituary and what it was our legacy. And I said, legacy is a penis word. Women don't think that way. <laughs> we are always the poorest of the poor. We, we, we are doing the menial work. We don't think of, of transcending and monuments in our name and trying to control our money from, from the grave. That's a masculine thing. Hmm. So I just couldn't give the keynote speech because I wasn't tuned with the legacy thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if you ask me, are you ready to die? Of course, because it doesn't matter if I die now or in 10 years. It's the same. Huh. I won't do in 10 years anything that I haven't already done. And then nobody cares. There's not another book that you want to write in particular? If, it, if I can write another book, I will be very pleased. But I'm not thinking that I still have something to do. Hmm. No. When did that happen? When did you get that feeling? when I turned 50. Uh. That was when I saw, when, when my daughter died in my arms, I lost the fear of death. And I realized that in her 28 years, Paula had done what she needed to do. And she could have lived 20 more years in a vegetative state, or she could have had a full life and died at 90. It, it, it wasn't important really. Hmm. Wow. I'm going to say something mushy now. No, don't. Just so Please you know. Please don't. No, I'm, gonna, I'm going to. I'm sorry. You're so amazing. Oh, you're, you're like, so sweet. You're like this <laughs> global treasure. You're a celebrity. You're iconic. <laughs> you're so lovely. And yet you're so incredibly grounded. You're so open-hearted. You're so <laughs> eloquent. You're, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I could keep going. Keep going. keep going. keep going. I have a thesaurus. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's extraordinary the way you're able to share yourself so honestly and openly. I mean, you're a but celebrity. You know, you know Don, people are all the same. Mm. Yeah, you, when, I remember when I wrote um, a memoir, my first memoir, my mother was horrified. And she said, you, you tell everything. You expose yourself completely. You are so vulnerable. And I said, Mom, it's not the truth I tell that makes me vulnerable, but the secrets I keep. Mm. 
Wow. And, and it's, I feel that by sharing, we all participate in the same experience of life. And that's what storytelling is all about. It's about connecting people, about telling other people, look, this happened to this person and it might happen to you. You are the same as the other one that is over there. We are the same as the Syrian refugees. We are the same as, as everybody else. And that is what storytelling is and that is why it's so important. Mm -hmm. And it has been with humankind since the beginning of language. It is the oldest, oldest art. So that's what, why I love my, my job, because I feel that, that I can say anything, I can share anything, I can grab any story. Words are free, I can use them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I love the way you use them. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one last question, um, which you may have just answered, actually, but... Then what, don't ask it. Well, <laughs> because you're going to come up with something new, I think. What truth would you most like all of us here tonight to take home with us? To me, the truest truth is that Love moves the world, and it's very cliché, because it's a cliché. But I think that we get to hear and know all the horrors, all the worst. This is in the news. This is what, what we hear. We are all the time aware of the horrible things that happen in the world. And I have a foundation. I see through the foundation all the goodness that there is. People who act out of love and compassion. And there's more of that than evil mm -hmm. and, and violence and death and greed. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, in this wealth of good intentions, of compassion, of love, needs to, be, to come to the surface. We need to tap into that. And, and make it more real to change the world. It, I hate the idea of changing the world. That's the typical thing that the Dalai Lama would say. I, I hate that. <laughs> but, but it's true. What, what we want a better world. We have to end the patriarchy, have another world. And I think that love can do that, mm. really. Well, on behalf of all of us, we love you. Oh. Thank you. Love you, love you, love you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.